Thank you, Jared, for joining us. I'm sure there's a lot of, uh, before I kind of throw you to the wolves and let the students at you with their rapacious questions, I thought I'd start and ask a few of my own. And first, I want to ask you a little bit about your former employer at the, at the State Department and just about kind of your, your role in that giant institution, an institution kind of invented for an era when it was impossible to communicate instantly across any, any significant distance. And, um, and, and, and how the State Department might be different now if you hadn't been kind of a champion of a certain way of thinking uh, when you were there. I think uh, uh, as a starting point, let me sort of describe what I what I walked into. Um, and when I when I came into, into government in, in 2006, um, the, the sort of understanding of, of technology in, in foreign policy circles was, was very very limited. And you know, this has nothing to do with me. It actually has nothing to do with even the rejection of technology by government officials. It has to do with the sort of state of technology in the world and how prevalent it was. Uh, but people didn't know what YouTube was. Uh, people, you know, were calling uh, you know, uh, Facebook, MyFace, you know, people, like, you literally got laughed out of the room for bringing up technology, and to the extent that it was talked about, it was talked as a, about as a tool to communicate and advocate policy, but even that was in question. So you just, it, to me, it's just sort of historically, you know, exceptional to see how far we've come since, since 2006, which really wasn't that long ago. Um, and, uh, you know, a lot of the people who are in government, you know, what they knew about technology, they learned from their kids, and most of them didn't like what their kids were, were, were doing on a lot of these technological platforms. And it was, you know, I actually give the greatest credit to shifted mindsets and changes just to what was happening in the world. Um, you know, I don't think you can give any one person or, or groups of people in the early stages credit for it. You know, as, as these events happened, the media was fascinated by them, you know, whether it was protests against the FARC in Colombia, uh, you know, whether it was a series of sort of failed revolutions, you know, the Green Revolution in Iran, even bad you know, sort of outcomes like WikiLeaks and, and others, every time something happened, the media became fascinated by it. I think there's no doubt that the media is fascinated by the role that technology plays in, uh, in geopolitics. And I think, especially in the early stages, there was a tendency to exaggerate a lot of this. So I remember um, I talked to a, a couple of Tunisian activists right after the Jasmine Revolution began. Uh, and mind you, this is you know, as recently as, as 2010. And I asked about you know, the role that, that, that technology played in starting the Jasmine Revolution. He said, you know, technology accelerated this, but it, but it didn't cause it. But shh, don't tell anybody that, because then the media will stop covering this tiny little country in the, in, in the Maghreb. And I thought that was sort of a, a, a charming example of um, uh, how people on the ground were, were you know, almost sort of exploiting the media's almost over-fascination with this. And what about, uh, how did you, why did you decide to move from a fairly significant leadership position in the, in the public sector at the, at the State Department at a pretty exciting time to, uh, to Google? So it, it's interesting. I, I guess I don't look at it that much as, as a change. I, I've been working on the same issues for the last, or at least since 2004. Um, and um, whether I worked on them as a sort of weird traveling student or uh, at the State Department under Rice or under Clinton or at Google, my day looks exactly the same. I sort of work on the same types of topics. I engage with some of the same sets of people. You know, I, I'm interested in a set of challenges that impact young people and uh, that are tied to stopping violence, right? So things like illicit networks, radicalization, weak and failed states. Um, these are challenges I've cared about for a long time. And uh, you know, different platforms and different jobs you know, give you a different set of resources and a different toolkit to play with to try to address those challenges. And I think I realized my time in government uh, was coming to an end when I found myself uh, spending inordinate amounts of time engaging with Silicon Valley. You know, I sort of, towards the end, uh, saw a lot of my mission as trying to get people in the technology sector to understand their relevance to a set of challenges that today don't have an obvious nexus with technology, that don't fall in an obvious philanthropy box, that don't fall in an obvious core business box, but we were seeing firsthand that you know, when you do post-conflict reconstruction, you need the perspectives of people that understand the tools. Uh, when you're doing earthquake relief in, in, in Haiti, when you're dealing with you know, sort of uh, politically repressive regimes, when you're dealing with ungoverned spaces. And um, I really enjoyed that engagement and found that uh, by the time I left government, it didn't you know, sort of need me in policy planning anymore. Um, and I wanted to go do it from the other side. Let, let me see if I can repeat back to you something you said, which I think is kind of central. And that is that some of the, some of the kind of central institutions of our time 
are not able to approach or engage with some significant problems. And yet technology is fueling kind of complexity, growth, and possible solutions to those problems. Is that so if you so let's look if you just actually look at some of the, the statistics, right? So if you look at the last ten years, internet access has risen from three hundred and sixty one million to more than two billion, mobile access from nine hundred and seven million to over five billion. So from those statistics and from those trends we can infer that in the next ten years uh, five billion new people will come online. Um, so more people are projected to come online than currently. That's almost all. So more, well, if you look at population growth, right? So more people are projected to be online in ten years than are physically on Earth today. Um, you know that is sort of plus or minus, you know, hundreds of billions. But the point is, a lot of people, a lot of people are going to be are going to be online, and the people who are coming on, online are coming online in parts of the world that are ridden with the greatest number of challenges. So this isn't Islamabad. This is Fatah. You know, this isn't Kabul. This is you know Ghazni and Farah province. You know, this isn't sort of the the major uh, you know cities. This is sort of the, the outskirts and. You know, most of the challenges that we dealt with day to day in, in, in government affected those communities that we know are going to come online. And so, what that means is technology is going to be part of every problem in the future, and it should therefore also be part of every solution. It's an equal opportunity enabler. And did I hear you right that you felt like, in many ways, the technology leaders didn't have a sense of that? That wasn't in their frame of reference. Um, they, they were open. They, they, they were open to the idea, but you ask a bunch of sort of technology CEOs to go to Iraq or go to Siberia or go to you know Colombia or go to the Democratic Republic of Congo. Um, you know, it's not exactly sort of in line with their core business. Um, now, what was interesting is um, there was a willingness on the part of the technology sector to explore the relevance of the tools that they were putting out in the public domain in some of these tough environments. And I was shocked by the sort of level at which these companies were willing to engage in terms of who was willing to actually come on these trips. Um, and you know, I think there was a period of socialization on both sides. We were trying to figure out how they were relevant to us. They were trying to figure out how we were relevant to them. And I think I, it finally dawned on me in a meeting in Russia um, where you know, the, Russians, uh, the Russian government had, you know, for a number of years, not believed us when we said that you know, a number of these companies won't actually invest in the U.S. unless you do A, B, and C on corruption and transparency and so forth. And having, you know, we were very diplomatic and polite about it, and then you bring these CEOs of these technology companies, and they sit in a meeting you know, in, in the Kremlin, and they're not so polite. They'll say, I have no interest in investing in your country. They literally beat them up on democracy. They beat them up on human rights. They beat them up on all these things in a way that's very credible. And then the Russian government um, is finds what they're saying so credible that they ignore us, you know, at that time the State Department, and separately contact the private sector delegation asking if they can drive them to the airport and talk more about it. And so it was like a totally different way of, you know, giving a diplomatic demarche in some respects. Um, it was a different way, it, it was sort of triangulating our, you know, sort of engagement with, with, with governments. So how does that, let's talk about then in that, the light of that Google Ideas. Does it, you know, Google Ideas is a business unit, right? Sort of. I, I don't actually know what you would call it. Um, I call it a think slash do tank because I, I yeah, there's not a sort of a better name yet. Um, you know, the, the the way that I think about it, based on what I was saying before, is you know, if you believe that technology is going to complicate every challenge in the world and should also be deployed to you know try to address every challenge in, in, in the world, there's a whole bunch of challenges that the technology sector is not thinking about. It's not just Google. Every every, every company. And as an industry, we need to think. You know, we, we need to think together about this. Google Ideas' goal is to basically look at all those challenges that our philanthropic arm isn't sort of, you know, set up to do, that our core business isn't set up to do, and by partnering with people in and outside of our company, uh, try to reframe these challenges in ways that, ways that account for technology. And by reframing them, try to figure out what types of technology solutions can be used to address them. So let me give you an example. Uh, illicit networks, so drug cartels, organized crime, human trafficking, organ trafficking, arms smuggling. Um, huge challenge. All we have to do is look south of our border and we can appreciate the, the gravity of, the, of, of this challenge. Um, you know, when you look at it from a government perspective, human trafficking is a human rights issue. Um, drug cartels is a DEA issue. Um, you know, arms smuggling is, is another issue. The mafia is a law enforcement issue. When you look at it through the lens of technology, what you see is a set of illicit networks who require secrecy and discretion in order to be able to function. Um, and when you look at it through the lens of technology, we think, okay, well, you know, if these organizations need secrecy and discretion, let's get a bunch of data and organize it and make it available and visualize it in interesting representative ways. And our logic is, is, is very simple. It's very hard for illicit networks to function if you know where the safe houses are, what parts of the border they're going across, what police precincts they're in bed with, um, and you map it all out. 
Now, I don't know if that will work or not, but the value of being at a technology company as opposed to in government is people are a little less sort of sensitive and, and certainly less risk averse. And so we're willing, you know, both because of, of our mission and because of our belief in what technology can do, uh, to sort of take a chance and, and, and explore whether or not technology uh, can be helpful. But then there's another piece of this, um, which is you might be wondering, well, why, you know, why would Google want to do that? You know, the example I like to give is when Google acquired YouTube, I guess, seven or, or eight years ago, you know, one day, uh, you know, engineers came to work and, you know, all of a sudden had to sort of talk about Anwar al and Al-Qaeda and all these terrorist groups because these videos were popping up online. Uh, now, that was a number of years ago. Now, when you talk to people at YouTube, I swear, it has, they're, they're like some of the world's leading experts on some of these terrorist groups and the nuances of their videos and sort of what constitutes, you know, incitement of violence and, and, and so forth. And so if we know that technology, as I said, is an equal opportunity enabler empowering people for good and for ill, I think we have to assume that many of these illicit networks use the same technologies that we all use. And just because it's not a news story doesn't mean we shouldn't be thinking about it. And frankly speaking, um, proactively thinking about the role of technology as opposed to crisis communications is a much more meaningful way to actually constructively engage on these issues if you want to have a lasting impact. So if we think about Google, uh, I mean, <clears throat> Google as a platform, right, and Google as a creator, maybe a new global public sphere of sorts where a lot of illicit networks can, um, can <coughs> have, have some agency or ability to participate in um, in in global politics, Google needs to needs to needs to have some awareness or ability to understand what what's at play and, and how to come to good solutions. I'd say the technology industry as a whole. I mean, yeah, I think sure. we're we're you know uh, a bigger tech you know we're a big technology company, and I think you know you know Google has a, a leadership role that it can it can uniquely play. Uh, on these issues for a variety of reasons, but I think you know success to me is whether other companies are are, are are joining with us on this. This isn't like proprietary stuff here. I mean, this is about uh, you know disrupting a very problematic and and and, and dangerous problem. Do Do you have in mind any? You said kind of earlier there wasn't good language for it. I think do tank. Do you have in mind any other models or examples of what of what you want Google Ideas to be? Um, you know, I. I when I started at Google, just this is sort of important to, to understand. You know, Google Ideas was one person, me, and it was totally <laughs> undefined. Right? I was told, come and create Google Ideas without, um, uh, you know, without sort of, you know, an org, org structure and, and you know, sort of a, even a, a mission statement. And you know, this is an incredible company with a lot of smart people, and I'm not an engineer. This is a company run by engineers. Had I actually realized how daunting that task was <laughs> at the time, I probably would have freaked out and not not, not joined. Um, I'm glad I did, and I'm glad I sort of had that that oversight. Um, but what it meant is it wasn't actually constructive for me when I first started at the company to sit down and come up with sort of a bunch of flowcharts and and you know mission statements and so forth. The logic was you know this is like a startup within you know. A, a company that gives me the luxury of not having to be in a garage and take out the trash. Um, and uh, I'm going to focus on trying to do a handful of things that would sort of surprise people that Google is doing and that can have an impact. And then every time we do something, we'll sit down as a team, and Kate, Kate certainly knows this, and figure out what we are. And my guess is five years from now, when we do something, whether it's big or small, we'll sit down and still be sort of asking what we are, and it will probably change over and over again. And so the one thing that I think will remain consistent um, or will remain constant is uh, the types of challenges that we focus on um, and this notion that what we do doesn't have to be tied to Google products um, and what we do um, will never be done exclusively by Google Ideas. So everything we do, we do with a coalition of partners. Right? We're experts on technology. We're not experts on the subject matter as a company and we understand that. But it still strikes me that Google has a lot of money and a lot of power in a variety of ways, right? And so, uh, to, to have that open-ended of an approach, you know, I guess it feels to me pretty high risk that you could really screw something up. Yeah, tell me about it. <laughs> um, um, it, it you know, it, it's, again, I hadn't <clears throat> thought about that piece of it that much at the, at the, at the beginning. Um, and when I, when I started, I had a very clear idea of the first thing that I wanted to do. Um, you know, I'd spent a lot of time in, uh, in the Middle East and Colombia and Central America interviewing gang members and uh, violent Islamist groups and, and, and violent nationalist groups. And I was just, I've always been really fascinated by why people join these groups. And I've always thought that there were similarities between why somebody joins a gang and why somebody joins a violent religious group. And so, um, uh, but I could never really do much with that in, in government. And there was a time in government where I wanted to bring a bunch of formers together 
Um, and I was, I was told it would, it would make a bad Washington Post headline. Um, but Google, for you know, you know, whatever reason, um, decided that they would let Google Ideas' its first project be to bring together 84 former gang members, former violent Islamists, former violent nationalists, and former violent uh, right-wing extremists. So to give you an idea, these are all people that left the organizations and are now actively and publicly working against them. So last June, we brought them all to, to Dublin. Uh, and we brought 20 survivors of, uh, of, of terrorism and survivors of, of gang violence. And the logic was Google's success as a technology company has given it this global brand and it has a convening power um, that can be used to convene around a really tough set of issues that maybe nobody else is willing to, to, to convene around. And so I, my, the way that I justified it was, you know, we organize the world's information, make it universally available, and make it useful, and we typically think of that in terms of data. Well, human perspectives are another sort of form of data, so we'll just bring humans together. Uh, that's sort of how I, um, how I explained it. Um, and, uh, and, and so we didn't really, you know, we, we, we didn't know if we could get all these people in one room. You can't just send an invite out to like former Bloods and Crips and former Ansari <laughs> Hezbollah and former FARC and expect them to come. And so we literally like, my, as, as we sort of grew the team, we'd be on the phone and, and, and you know, like the former white supremacists are gonna walk out if the former gang members don't do this. And it was like a sort of behind the scenes uh, negotiation. And the purpose was we were trying to, I, I guess what we were testing was whether Google can convene a set of stakeholders who have never been in the room together, but who we hypothesize should be in the room together around a very tough uh, challenge. And can and we- And that other people could not convene, that the US government wasn't going to convene. Correct. Um, and I think Google, because of its brand awareness, actually can get people to come to things. Um, and uh, we were able to get everybody uh, to come to this. And, our, and then our next goal was, can the network, will the network be able to grow and sustain organically on its own? And so after we did all this, we decided, okay, at least right now, you know, this was sort of circa, you know, last summer, uh, when, when Kate was in, in, interning, um, you know, we said, okay, we're sort of like a venture capitalist firm for ideas, right? We're going to sort of, you know, pick a challenge, reframe it in ways that account for technology, parachute in, um, and with lots of partners, try to do some sort of proof of concept for what we mean, and then we'll make an exit. Uh, sort of metaphoric, the, you know, you know the, the metaphor of an exit is when, you know, other people are sort of taking what we did and running with it, and, you know, ultimately success is if nobody even remembers where it originally came from. So do we affect the discourse? Are more people working with formers? Are the seven Nigerians that were in the same city that had never met each other now doing uh, more work together? Um, you know, sort of small and medium-sized metrics, uh, and that's what we decided after this, and I'm sure we'll just keep reevaluating. All right, time to open this up to some questions. Alex. I wanted to ask you about the limits of technology. Uh, limits now with 2 billion online, in 10 years with 7 billion online. Um, you, you were talking earlier about the sort of sunshine as a disinfectant, basically opening data uh, as, as a way of um, allowing illicit networks to be more effectively combated. But, um, are there cases in which technology simply is limited in what it can do? In particular, I know that you've done work on the Rwandan genocide, and of course, like, we've got Syria right now, and there's a question, there's a vacuum, it would seem, of power and possibility. Is that a vacuum that has something to do with the limits of what can be achieved through or with technology? I mean, technology is a tool, it's not a silver bullet answer for, for anything. And I, I think it's, it's hard to imagine things that technology on its own can solve, right? You can't eat it if you're starving. You can't, you know, um, you know, use it as an effective shield if somebody from the cartels is attacking you. Although when I was in, you know, Eastern DRC, you know, I told a, a number of women refugees that there was skepticism that mobile phones were helpful to them. And they said, well, even if they don't work, we can throw them at people. Um, <laughs> not that that's sort of like actually, you know, analytic analytically useful, but it's a funny anecdote. Um, the, uh, um, so of course there's, and, and there's not just limits in terms of what technology can do. I mean, I, I'm very adamant about, you know, describing the ways that technology can also exacerbate problems, right? They, they you know, anybody can, can, can use it. Um, and you know, I think a lot about this in the context of, of, of terrorism, right? So. Can you imagine sort of the advent of, of every man drones as kind of the new IED? Um, you imagine people in Latin America moving from physical kidnapping to virtual kidnapping, where people hijack your identities and hold them ransom. I mean, the, the, you can just sort of imagine a lot of different ways this happens. And you know, I, was, I was speaking in a, in, a, in a class earlier today where I sort of described the 9-11, future 9-11 that I fear as 
not coordinated physical attacks, but coordinated physical and cyber attacks. That you know, it starts with a cyber attack that makes a physical attack more easier, uh, ma makes physical attack easier, and then it's followed by another cyber attack that makes it harder for the attack neighborhood to actually uh, deal with emergency response and, and, and crisis and, and so forth. And that's that's I think I that. But you know, the pragmatic reality of all this is you know, whether you like it or not, you know, the technology is spreading. It's going to become smaller, cheaper, and offer more power in the hands of a single individual for good or for ill. So I find these debates about is technology good or bad not that useful. I find it much more interesting to figure out if we know it's both you know, good and bad, how do we ensure it's more of a net positive? In some sense, what you, the way you're describing Google Ideas, it makes me think of in, Google kind of growing up a little and coming to realize its role as a major global institution, right? Taking on some institutional responsibility. I, th I think there's definitely a, a so there, there's a responsibility aspect of this. I described the core business aspect of this, yeah. which is you know it's better to be proactively you know engaging in these challenges than having to react to you know bad news stories and, and so forth. But the, I think the the larger motivation is that sense of responsibility. I think one of, one of the things that I found when I got to Google is the, um, the sort of activist spirit of the company is actually very real. I didn't actually think it was before I joined the, the, the company. People really believe in what they're, they were hired at Google to do, and they really believe in what technology can do. Now, at times, you have to sort of walk people back. Um, at times, you, you, you want to sort of you know, push people in one direction or another, but uh, I've never been in a place where people um, are so optimistic, idealistic, and enthusiastic about finding a way to use these tools for good. And, and you know, given that we have a little bit of a translation problem between the people who work on these challenges every single day and the people who understand the actual uh, the actual technology and tools, um, I think that's actually a, a total win for society because you have people in the technology industry who may not be experts on you know Mexican drug cartels or you know state failure and fragility or you know how to make institutions more transparent, but they like absolutely want to sign up for it even if it means they have to work on weekends and evenings. Yeah. Um, so my question is about Google's relationship with uh, government agencies. Are you talking a lot about um, you know all kinds of tools that can really help? governments and state and local agencies basically make the world a better place. But unfortunately, there is a big disconnect between you know, the way governments use technologies and the way non-state actors use technology. And you know, for example, I work with police departments. You know, They're not going to sign up for, for Google.org public alerts if they're not even using Facebook. So my question is, um, is Google doing any type of hand-holding or helping government agencies really kind of not just change the way they use technology, but change the way they think about technology and exposure? Because without that, really, they won't be able to make use of any of these tools. Yeah, so I actually agree with you. Um, and you know, it goes back to what I said before, which is you know, technology on its own can't solve a problem, right? So you have, you know, technology needs to, it, it's sort of a complement to something. So you need a good program if you want that program scaled, uh, right? So technology can scale, it can accelerate, it can make things more efficient. Um, but then the other, you know, the other piece of this is, is, the, is the training aspect of it, right? You know, it, it's, it's not good enough for us, for us to say that you know large numbers of people are gonna are gonna come online just because they're gonna come online doesn't mean they're immediately gonna start using those tools to address all their local challenges. Now, one thing I do often say, and I, I believe this very much, that um, there's no greater driver of, of innovation than necessity. And, and and I think smart engineers who develop technologies are often it's why they're often surprised when their technologies uh, are used in ways that they didn't imagine in highly repressive or poor environments. And so. Again, in the class I spoke at earlier today, I sort of asked, you know, I asked the same question here, how many of you by show of hands have you know, spent considerable amount of time in the developing world? All right, so you know, probably almost almost everybody. And so we've all seen examples of how you know people take very little and do a lot with it. And you know, what they have lasts them a long time and they're just really good at refurbishing. It's the same thing with technology, right? The sort of you know, year you know, the annual upgrades that we get to our phones and the new computers that we frequently get, you know, that's a luxury that we have. But um, if you know, if you're in a repressed environment that's also poor, um, and you have a device, and you know, you know, you're going to have it for a while. You're going to learn how to use it for different things that you know probably the engineers who developed it, you know, couldn't even begin to imagine. Because as much as you don't want to believe that you can live without your phone, you actually can, right? It's a luxury for you. Your you freedom of speech and freedom of assembly. If you live in Iran, uh, that's not the case. And so um, you might, if you're an Iranian citizen, use that device as a way to uh, try to get around regime restrictions. Um, as a way to create opportunities for yourself, as a way to circumvent uh, restrictions of your, your civil liberties. Now, it does, it's not going to give you civil liberties, but it's at least a tool that you didn't have before. So, like, when you pick up 
when you pick up foreign policy or the Council of Foreign Relations, I mean, it strikes me that to a large extent you're still kind of a translator between two worlds in a sense, like a diplomat, right? Between a very traditional institutional political decision-making world and the technology private sector decision-making world. And that, that, that what's, what, what's missing in some sense is like an intellectual exchange between the two. It's going gonna, it's gonna to take time, but it, it's, I mean, my, my, if I look at my two employers, the Council of Foreign Relations and, and, and Google, um, there is a translation challenge, but one thing that's changed is the will is there on both sides. So people, people on the technology side know that they need to better understand the challenges in the world that don't touch their day-to-day -day activities, and people who work on foreign policy and international relations know that they need to understand these tools. Right? You know, a good example of this is it's no longer cool if you're older to make fun of your lack of knowledge of technology. Now you're trying to sort of fabricate you know, knowledge that you don't necessarily have, which we often all do. Um, and, uh, and, and so I think that, to me, is, is one sign of change. But it also, I guess, a big chunk of my optimism comes when I sit in, in rooms like this, because you know, I, I'm, I'm, in some respects, envious of, of, of people who, who are in school right now, because um, you are, you know, we're the first generation socialized with high prevalence of these technologies, and while you're uh, in school, you have the luxury of you know, kind of thinking about you know, how these tools apply to everything, and you know, whatever you're working on, whether you're going to go into the nonprofit sector or whether you're going to go into the public sector, it doesn't really matter. Technology, you know, for you, you know, is probably an innate, you know, uh, sort of skill set that you don't even view as a skill set. And I think that the biggest mistake that I see students make is not appreciating that uh, that knowledge of technology is something that can be immediately translated as a comparative advantage vis-a-vis -vis everybody that you're working with and whatever you do next. And so to not apply technology and to not sort of, you know, sort of leverage your own innate technology expertise is to basically shoot yourself in, in, in the foot and to essentially, you know, uh, you know, miss an opportunity to actually add value um, out, of, out of the gate, whatever you, you, you do next. And I think the best ideas on, on, on what this intersection between technology and international relations means is going to come from a new generation that doesn't question the value of, 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 of these tools. And so when I think about this, like, you know, I'm sure, you know, in 20 years, you know, when I you know, have a family and so forth, um, my kids will be, you know, using a technology and I'll say, I can't for the life of me understand why they're using this, but I remember from when I was that age, I'm not going to question it. Um, I know it's important because they're all using it. And we, we have that, we, we've lived that, and so we understand that, and, and just don't discount it, and just because everyone uses technology that, 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 that's our age, um, don't forget the fact that it's a unique skill set relative to a lot of people in the working world, especially in government. It's like one of the best advertisements ever for my fall class. <laughs> <laughs> Great syllabus. Here, we'll go here. Um, thank you so much. My question has to do with um, the amount of power that a community like Google has. Um, if, you know, I personally, and maybe many of us in, in this room, take a lot of <coughs> comfort in the don't be evil um, theme and, and, and um, think that what Google does is, is really quite good a lot of the time. Um, but things like the recent protests of SOPA, where Wikipedia went black, and we didn't go black, but certainly um, demonstrated its power, have, have shown the ability of such companies to really have enormous and immediate influence on uh, decisions from government. My question then to you is, do you think that um, some of what you're doing actually has the potential to be more powerful than what the government itself can do? And um, do you see any uh, reason or need for there to be limitations on that power, either for you or for other players in the space? So it's a hard question for me to answer because Google Ideas is built so we don't do anything on our own. Mm -hmm. So everything I do, I do with you know other private sector partners, academics, practitioners on the ground, NGOs, people with unique experiences, sometimes governments. And so I can only evaluate the coalitions that, 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 that we built. And I do believe that, that um, you know, it, it's going to be very hard for any one sector discipline or experience to, on their own, solve any problem in the future. I, I do believe in the sort of eternal dominance of states and in the international system. I think they're losing some of their sovereignty. I don't think that they're going to be overhauled. I don't think you know, the fundamentals of international relations are, are, are going to change. I think it's you know slightly disrupted and turbulent, and you know citizens do have more power now than they did before. Companies do have more influence now than they did before, but that doesn't mean that international relations is going to be turned upside down. You know the way that I describe this is you know cyberspace is the world's largest ungoverned space, and just as ungoverned spaces sort of complicate you know uh, sovereignty for states and you know various issues in the international system, so too well cyberspace is just really big. Um, 
And what my interesting observation though with companies is 10 years ago, um, there were probably, you could probably count how many uh, CEOs of uh, technology companies could meet with you know, sort of large and diverse numbers of senior government officials from just about any country. Um, now it's just extraordinary. There's such an eagerness and desire to um, sort of embrace certain aspects of technology, understand technology, that the diplomatic field has gotten very crowded. So it's not just you know, uh, you know, CEOs of companies, it's directors at, at companies. It's not just, um, you know, chairmen and, and, and big companies, it's people running startups. And so what that means is there's just a lot of perspectives that are being floated in diplomatic settings that weren't 10 years ago. Um, and there's an interesting responsibility that, 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 that comes, with, comes with that as well. I think different, you know, I think it's gonna be very hard for any technology company in the future to be neutral on anything. Um, because, as I said, I think technology intersects with every single challenge, and so you can either proactively, as a company, decide how you want to think about a challenge, or you can have to react uh, to it once you, you're, you're, you're confronted with it. And I think the next 10 years is going to be an incredibly turbulent and interesting time where we see companies trying to figure this out, we see states trying to make sense of it, and we, sit as, we see citizens, um, you know, kind of uh, trying to uh, sort of make sense of, you know, how much they want to share or not share. Um, how much of a robust role they want to play or not play. Uh, so my question, thank you. My question is kind of three part. First of all, part of me is concerned about your personal safety and I hope you travel wide guards because I think some of the things that you're, you will be uncovering may be seen as provocative or incendiary. Um, so that's, you know, as I see it, I, I wonder if you have concerns about that. And um, that's one conflict I see. And another conflict I see between the work that you're doing and the work I think the government wants to be doing. And, Unearthing, you know, where illicit networks are um, hiding out or doing whatever. And then my, the third part of my question and the third conflict I see a question about is um, the former gang members and terrorists you worked with. You know, on the one hand, they're volunteering information to you that is in a way undermining them. Um, and I'm just wondering how they sort of made sense of that, you know, how they made sense of their contribution to your project. And given you know, that your goal overall is to bring light to illicit networks. Uh, so I'll take the, the last one first. Um, the I don't, when, when we were vetting these formers, um, they had to have they had to already have a track record of using their name, um, and they had to be publicly willing to speak out against these organizations. And we needed to be able to verify that for a number of reasons. Which is, once you do that, you take a you cross a certain threshold, um, and you, you assume a certain risk. Two, I was worried about asylum seeking. Um, you know, again, one of the things that I'm you know, we're a public company, and I can do things like Google Ideas because the company's for-profit arm does very well. Um, now, the sort of most damning thing that Google Ideas could do would be to not show respect to that for-profit arm and do something that could actually, you know, sort of jeopardize it, which means I can't do whatever I want, right? I'm, I'm constrained by the limits of being in a public company, and by the way, I should be. Um, the, uh, on, on the second question um, about, or sorry, on the first question of personal, you know, security, I think these things are always a, a, a calculation. Um, you know, I, I care a lot about these issues, um, and uh, you know, I've been working on them for you know, not a long time, but a long time relative to you know, being 30, and, um, and I'm not going to stop working on them. Um, you know, I'm fortunate that I work at a, at a company where um, you know, they, they prioritize people's uh, safety and, and, and security, and there's a number of examples of, of, of uh, the company, uh, company proving this. And on your second point, I don't know if this answers it, but um, one of the most interesting adjustments to me coming from a foreign policy world to Google is I'm used to talking about foreign policy. Google's not an American company, Google's a global company. Um, so Google doesn't have a foreign policy because it doesn't represent any particular state. So Google has a mission statement, Google has a set of values, and Google has shareholders. Um, and it's just a totally different way to think about, um, I don't even know what you would call it. I don't have, there's not the equivalent word of statecraft that I've been able to come up with. Maybe one of you will, will coin something cool. Um, mm -hmm. But it, it was a real paradigm shift for me. And it's been really fun, challenging, and rewarding thinking about how to address some of these challenges, not through the lens of a particular company, but through the lens of a set of values and a mission, which is bizarre and interesting. I have a very practical question to ask. Take a concession road. You have out there in the world people struggling to do a proper concession contract, and this is a problem from Sao Paulo to Latin America. And on the other hand, you have, as Google, a stash of documents 
that is helpful to those people. <coughs> this is the World Bank putting its PPP contracts online. This is everyone out there. You have a huge database. Yet, you are not useful to those people. You haven't yet found the technology to connect this local need with the vast amount of data that you already have, filtering it in a way that is useful to one guy who can click through to Google someday, and I hope you will, you know, you put this service out there for public policymakers, and they will be able to search in particular ways. You know, I want a concession contract. What is, you know, I'm in uh, Southeastern Europe. What is Sao Paulo doing? You know, what is China doing? I want a contract in this thing. Why should I build it up from scratch? Google can offer me a document that someone somewhere out there has put online that you can just grab. But there isn't that <coughs> filtering mechanism yet that can can do that effectively. So I'm just wondering if that's a project you might take on. I don't. To I admittedly, just because I'm new to the company, I don't totally know what you're talking about. But but it, it's. I'll sort of try to answer it answer it broadly, which is. Um, Google's 11, 12 years old, plus or minus a year. It, it's, it's not that old. Um, and uh, I'm sure any, everybody in here could think of a dozen things that they would love Google to, to take on. I think that because it's a private sector, you know, uh, you know for-profit public company, um, the primary responsibility is to, is to shareholders, right? And so, you know, uh, I actually think it's amazing how much Google's doing outside of its core business um, for reasons, you know, you know no other than, than there's one or two Googlers who are from this country or from that country that just really care about it. So I literally have not come into, I have literally not found a single country that doesn't have a Google employee from it that is championing some random project um, in, in that country. Um, and I, it, there's something so non, there's something so flat and non-hierarchical about it. Um, and uh, yeah, so I don't have a good answer for you as to why Google's not doing th this particular project. Um, uh, my guess is, if it's interesting to somebody at the company, they will find a way to they will find a way to do it. Or, um, you know, maybe you'll do it one day. I don't know. <laughs> um, where are you right now as an organization? Are you looking to bring on people? And if so, <laughs> do I highlight the <laughs> Um So, you know, again, we we one of the things we do discuss, you know, uh, which kind of contradicts what I was saying before about not wanting to spend too much time thinking about organizational structure and so forth is size. Um, and, and we've deliberately made a decision not to talk too much about it uh, publicly just because we don't want to, um, you know, we don't want to sort of box ourselves into, you know, being this size or, or that size. What I could say is we have, you know, sort of a small, you know, uh, number of direct hires, right? You know, less, you know, around, around 10, um, you know, and depending on sort of where we are with hiring, you know, plus or minus one or two. Um, I don't think, at least right now, I don't see it getting that much bigger than that, in part because I want to keep it very flat. I want to maintain the a Google Ideas culture that I think is fitting with Google's larger culture of being able to sit in a room and brainstorm ideas and anybody, regardless of what level they are, being able to sort of champion and champion something. And because we're so externally facing, right? Remember when I said we don't at Google, you know, or Google Ideas at least sit, sit in a room and think, you know, okay, how do we fix this? We bring in a lot of different people. Um, and so we uh, we borrow people from other parts of the company. They come on for a quarter, two quarters. We you know, borrow people from think tanks and academic institutions. And so if you think about the way that uh, like the, the National Security Council, for instance, is organized, there's a small number of direct hires, and then people from other government agencies are detailed uh, to the NSC for one to two or, or, or three years. We actually like the, the sort of small number of, of permanent people and then detailing people based on their expertise. Because we never know exactly what we're going to do next, we want to bring people in because of their particular expertise, whether they're in or outside of the company, to work on a specific project. And if it makes sense to you know, keep them on board you know, afterwards, it, it really depends on what the project is. Hi, I have a question. First, I'd like to know your comment. I think it's somewhat disingenuous to talk about Google that doesn't really care about these things and so forth. And that just you know, we bring a bunch of people in and talk with them, and then they go off and do what they do, and good luck to them. Like with the, uh, clearly nobody is that on thinking about the role they play, and certainly the folks at Google are sensitive to it. But here specifically, you talked at the beginning about the people that came in, you got the formers together, talked about what they could do, or whatever, you had some time with them. And then they're, you know, you finish with that, and they're going off doing what they're doing. Don't you have, you certainly have an opportunity, don't you also have a responsibility to help them to take advantage of what you did 
there are tools they could use, there's technology they could use, there's stuff that might be developed, there are uh, relationships that could be built. Maybe you're doing more than you said, maybe you don't want to talk about it, but really having people come in and then say, okay, have, have a good time, guys, strikes me as not optimum for anybody. Um, so that's not actually how it, how it went down. Um, we, uh, we convened people together and then we one we can't we, we made a decision that we're not going to our responsibility isn't to now engage with every single form of violence it's not what we should be doing as, as a technology company what we do what we did think we can do is create the technological plumbing you know meaning create space for these individuals to connect with each other to connect with people who have legal resources financial resources uh, who are willing to offer various in-kind uh services and so what we committed to is actually creating a platform that uh, maps out the, the, the counter-radicalization space. What we committed to was uh, providing training for former violent extremists on what our flagging policies are on YouTube because they cared a lot about this. So we've actually done a, a, a fair amount of engagement with these formers, but we haven't done it beyond what we think are, you know, what, what we think is appropriate for us to do, and it's not the Google Ideas model. You know, the reason it's called Google Ideas is because we're trying to change how people think about and act on these, these, these challenges. I don't think that Google Ideas is the appropriate outfit to try to solve the universe of counter-radicalization. I do think that we're uniquely positioned to help people think about the role of technology in it. I do think that we're uniquely positioned to pilot and seed proofs of concept that uh, can scale and sustain over time. And so that's what we've done. Um, you know, A lot of it will be uh, going public on uh, around April 25th. Um, and there's a lot of things that we do that we choose not to talk publicly about because that's not how we're measuring ourselves. Um, our goal is to change the ecosystem around these, these, these challenges and make sure that technology is, is part of the solutions and part of the reframing. And if talking about it publicly helps us advance that, we'll do it. Um, if not talking about it publicly, publicly advances that, we'll, 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 go that we'll, we'll go that route. But it, it's very important not to confuse Google Ideas with a arm of the company that has in-house engineers and building products, and so it's just not the model. Um, you may disagree with the model that we have, but it's not the model at least you know a year and some change in that we've got. Um, I have a question. Uh, I have a question about the fact that you're doing massive innovation in global networks, which is obviously a huge change. And we know with change comes fear of change. So I'd like to know, if you have any interesting conversations with your government affairs and public policy staff that say, you know, um, we think you may not be wanting to touch that particular bomb or that particular issue, and what kind of pushback are you getting from Google government affairs or policy around some of the work that you're doing? So if I didn't get any pushback, I would actually be concerned. I would right. be concerned for two reasons. One, it would mean that we're not um, putting out anything new. Um, and uh, or it would mean that you know people aren't paying attention to the policy uh, constraints or, and responsibilities we have to our shareholders. And um, you know I think that you know any entity, whether it's a technology company, an NGO, or a government, um, you know is going to always have a healthy internal tension that I think is incredibly important. And I find that that more often than not. Um, when internal objections are raised to certain ideas I have, um, or my team has, um, it's oftentimes because there was something going on at the company that I didn't even know about. Um, and so it's a very useful way to get internal feedback and situational awareness. I look at it actually as a very important check on what we do. Again, I go back to the point that Google Ideas is a discretionary arm of, of, of the company. Um, and so we're able to do you know, some of these innovative, you know, different projects that are outside of the, the, the core business because, you know, the business is doing well. If the business doesn't do well, you know, the, we all know the first things to go are oftentimes the discretionary pieces of the company. And so it's, um, uh, I, I would describe it as a very important, you know, healthy tension. Uh, I mean, sometimes they're, sometimes they're geographic, sometimes they're related to, uh, uh, you know, various legal things that are going on. Sometimes they're related to certain announcements that we have forthcoming. Um, you know, it's, it's, there's so much going on at the company that nobody can possibly have visibility into everything, and that's part of what, um, you know, our, our excellent policy shop does, is that, you know, they, they, uh, they, they make sure that we're not tripping on ourselves. Yeah, just to continue with that, so even before they get to the check stage, I'm interested in how you come up with the ideas and the problems you want to work on. So the extremism thing you talked about, it seemed like it's something you've worked on for a while. I know mobile justice has been sort of close to case heart for a while. Um, so those obviously came from personal things. So that's the first question. Where do those ideas come from? 
and you have a mechanism for soliciting from within Google or even even outside a little bit. And the second is, do you have a, an, an idea um, or like a, a, how how do you think about the problems that you're tackling up to, as far as whether it's ways that technology can be applied anew to certain problems versus problems that are sort of inherent within the world of technology and especially within Google's around um, making those better. So whether it's privacy or whether it's censorship or, or whether it's extremists using YouTube or Twitter. So those are sort of two different problems you could tackle. I wonder how you think about that. I have a better answer for you on the first one, um, which is uh, you know, we have a small team and you know, I like it to be very democratic, so we sit around and talk about what we have bandwidth to take on, and you know we make a collective decision. Sometimes it, you know, it, it uh, you know, all the ideas come from one person. Sometimes they come from another person, but we make a unanimous group decision. So when we decided to do illicit networks, um, you know, we, you know, all sat around at a retreat and you know thought, okay, what's a huge, what's a huge challenge that doesn't have anybody leading the charge, uh, where nobody's paying attention to technology that's timely, um, that has a more obvious nexus with technology than the radicalization project that we did, um, and this is what we all sort of came up with. There's not a more sophisticated mechanism. It's not like we have a sort of a committee and a submissions process. And so yeah, I suppose anybody could walk by you know our office space and suggest an idea, and if we really like it, we'll. we'll We'll do it. I suppose you could email me something, and if we really like it, you know, we'll we'll do it. We don't have a sort of. I wouldn't say we have a, a, a particularly you know sophisticated process, but you know, we have a budget process, and we have. Um, and so when we go through that budget process, we have to justify what we're doing, um, right? And that, that's again yet another important important check. Um, on the second point, um, I think we'll go back and forth on this. I think there'll be times where we feel some pressure to do something that is uh, more in our sweet spot. Um, I think there'll be times where we do something that's sort of wildly off our sweet spot. I, I don't know. You might ask me in six months, and I'll give you a completely different answer. And, and part of the fun of, of Google Ideas is, is um, it's sort of a, it's a model that we're iterating on as we as, as, as we go along. And so there's a, a phrase in the technology industry, you know, launch and iterate. And that's kind of what this is, right? We launch Google Ideas, and we're kind of constantly iterating on it. Um, and uh, you know, we want to we want to have impact. We want to change how people think about and act on these challenges. We'll probably get some things right. We'll probably get some things wrong. Some things might have a lot of impact. Some things might might flop. Um, but I, I think the most important thing is that the team as a whole feels invested in this, and that as much of the company as possible, uh, you know, feels uh, in, in, invested in this. And, and that's really all you know I can sort of say with any you know, certainty about it. I think in some ways, the three issues you talk about, uh, certainly fragile states and illicit networks, in the case could be made for counter-radicalization. They're all places where the technology has had, perhaps, disproportionate impact. Right. Mm -hmm. Right. I'll come back to this side. We'll go here yeah. and go to the back. Hi. Um, I feel like one thing that technology tends to be really good at is tracking outcomes and setting up the foundation framework for that. So I was just curious with some of the examples that you talked about, uh, how you, if you're tracking outcomes from the project that so you kind of start you, and say, okay, now we have, now you guys go and continue doing this work, do you have any kinds of outcome measures that you have? So it depends on the initiative, right? So some things will have a very easy quantitative way to measure them. Um, you know, I think like for instance the project that, 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 that Kate did, right? You, you know how many you know, decisions are online, how many people are using them, and so forth. Then there's some that are more, there are some that are going to be more qualitative. Um, this is you know, sort of another example of, of something that we as a team decided: do we want to lean more towards quantitative metrics or more towards qualitative metrics, or do we want it to be an even split? One thing that, that is sort of part of our model is every project, and, and this goes to your point, sir, back there, um, that we don't sort of leave things stranded. Every project that we do, we find a permanent owner and find a permanent owner that can scale it. So the sort of mapping out the counter-radicalization space, we found a permanent owner for that. We gave them a grant. Um, they're driving it forward. It's designed to sustain and grow um, and grow separately from us with a partner that's much more appropriate to engage all these different stakeholders. So this is, it's not it's not sort of announced yet. So it's, it's um, but uh, but this this is this is part of our, our model. So we can hold our you know the nice part about this by the way is when you provide you know grant money to an implementer or an owner um, you know there's metrics that sort of go with that as well. And so that that's one way that we're thinking about it. Um, there are many social media companies that have subscribers more than more than populations of many countries. Right? Uh, how are nation states reacting to that? Reacting to that, like 
in the future, will we, will we have a U.S. ambassador to say Facebook or something? Like that? Um, I, I don't think you should have. I, I hope I hope we don't go in the direction of U.S. ambassadors to companies because I think that that you know it, it's not, not to the company but to the full subscribe. <coughs> um, I mean. I, I think what you have now is you have engagement, you have government engagement in the online space, right? So it's not it's not about Facebook or Google Plus or YouTube, it's about human, these are still human beings, right? So it's just, they're, they're just sort of, you know, talking and, 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 you know, existing in different platforms other than the physical domain. So it's very important not to treat the technological space as something separate and weird. It's still human beings that are sort of engaging in these, in, in these platforms. And so you have to, it's still a human to human, Engagement, right? You're not sort of engaging with a robot, um, and, uh, and and so I wouldn't. Uh, the way that I would think about this is you're going to see much more robust uh, engagement in the digital space uh, between physical individuals. A good example of, of what I could imagine happening in, in the media space, for instance, is you know as you know if you look at you know Pakistan today, right? You know big chunks of Islamabad are online. No part of Fatah, for the most part, is, is online. So that's going to change. And you can imagine sort of a self-proclaimed journalist, you know, going, you know, and contacting somebody in South Waziristan and, you know, uh, engaging them and promising them all sorts of things that don't fall in line with ethical standards. And um, you have a problem on your hand because somebody has been compromised because they believe that this person is a journalist just because they said they're a journalist, right? And so there's a lot of scenarios that will, will pop up um, as people who sort of aren't held accountable engage in the digital space with people who are used to engaging with people in the physical space that can be exactly. Um, good to see you, Jared. Good to see you, um, I, uh, One of your colleagues, Anne-Marie Slaughter, wrote a piece in Foreign Affairs that talks about sort of a shift from a traditional model of like hard or economic power being sort of central in the world to networked power. And she gives this example of like, the difference between men and women and men see a structure or a structure and they try to get to the top of it and women see like a web of relationships and they try to get to the center of it which sort of suggests that the latter is going to become a more dominant sort of place in the world and they look at what's happened in your career thus far you've had a very versatile sort of set of roles and you've gotten to the center of a lot of networks have like several hundred thousand twitter followers you know um it strikes me that you could probably provide some like insight to the group on how you think um, either an approach that you use, it almost seems like you're more of an ethnographer when you come to like certain problems as opposed to like a traditional business approach to a problem. Like is, are there different approaches that you use? And then secondly, do you think there are certain businesses or governments that are at risk from using sort of a hard power or economic power approach when they should be using more of a connectivity network approach? That's a very good question. Um, you know, it, it's. It's that whatever I'm doing, it's not a calculated formula, um, so I'll try to best describe what I think I'm doing. Um, and maybe it works, maybe it doesn't work, I don't, I don't know, but it, it, for, for better or for worse, it's what I do. Um, you know, I get an idea that I'm really excited about. Um, and typically I won't get excited about something if I, unless I feel like it's different, it's controversial, it pushes the envelope, it fosters debate, um, and then I just go do it and I bring all my friends with me. Um, and then, and sometimes they're like new friends, and then I bring them on to the next thing. And so there's like a, it's just sort of, I just end up working with the same, you know, sort of types of growing networks of people on like everything that I do, or at least ask them if they want to work with me. And I don't really pay much attention to whether what they do is relevant to it. And I guess maybe that's the, the main lesson, right? Like, you know, if I'm working on something, I think this, I think you're smart. Um, I think you're creative. I don't care if this is totally irrelevant to what you do. I really need you to help me with this. Um, and oftentimes I find that in doing that, you can get somebody excited about what you're doing and, and, and they think it's irrelevant to them. That's usually a good thing because it means that somewhere along the lines or some, somewhere along the way, you'll, 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 you'll find a relevance uh, that, that neither of you realize existed. So I guess that's my main lesson. And then the other one is, is um, it really is amazing you know, who you can sort of pull together if you just ask. I know that sounds really stupid and, and, and maybe uh, insignificant, but it, I find people are often very afraid to ask people to do things and ask people to come to things. And um, you know, my model for convening, right? I think, I think convening is a very powerful tool. And my model for convening is who are the most interesting people that I can put in a room together who have never actually been in, a, in one place but need to be. Um, and so I actually try to find people that have nothing in common um, and put them all together. It's sort of like the ideal cocktail. Yeah, sort of. Yeah, something like that. <laughs>
Right. Yeah. Um, where do you envision Google Ideas to be five years from now, or ten years from now? And what are the one or two things on your mind that you want to work on next? Um, it's hard for me to know, you know, as an organization, where it will be. Um, what I do know is, I right now, I I sort of describe Google Ideas as in the startup phase of not being profitable yet. And I don't mean I literally I don't literally mean you know profitable. I mean the metaphor that I'm using is you know is you know I want to get to a point where Google Ideas is so relevant to the company um, <coughs> that it sustains and exists regardless of who is on the team. And that's my sort of metaphorical profit. Um, and then a uh, a second. Uh, place where I want to see Google Ideas in five years. I'd love to see um, this model adopted more widely throughout the industry and have all these different companies working on these issues together because it, it really transcends sort of proprietary stuff. It transcends competition between these companies. Um, and it, it, it's exciting and important sets of challenges to, 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 to work on. So I think that's where I want it. That's where I want it to be. Uh, I want to offer you an idea and then ask a question. Throw it out there. Um, <clears throat> I would like to see social media be used for economic development the same way that it was used for political uh, development over the last year and for uh, survival survival technology, appropriate technology, to disseminate that information for economic and health and uh, ecological reasons around the world much more quickly than it is now. The question is, <clears throat> So you have illicit networks. Occupy is an illicit network, can be considered an illicit network. The same tools that you use to break up drug dealers and uh, fundamentalist uh, terrorist groups can also break up groups that are, for instance, in Macedonia last year, protesting using social media against police violence. Certainly the police looks at that, can look at that as an illicit network. So the tools that you're developing, of course, have double, if not triple, or quadruple edges. How are you going to deal with that? I mean, as, as I've said, you know, every tool that's put out in the public domain, if it's free, anybody can use it. Right? So there's going to be risks. And I think as a company, the responsibility is how do you mitigate those risks. Um, and, but I, I don't think it's just the companies. Right? These tools are, you know, in some respects, mitigating these risks requires all the other stakeholders. You know, whether they're, you know, uh, you know, NGOs or people on on the ground, you know, helping come up with ideas for how to actually ensure that the empowerment is a is, is a net positive. But yeah, I mean, every every technology is going to be a double or quadruple edged sword. So I know you said that you appreciate, um, you know, pushback as a measure of how you know you're uh, you're making inroads. I'm wondering if you can speak to the, the kind of pushback that you know you and technology uh, received at the State Department, and give us a sense of how how you were able to maneuver through you know that resistance. I mean, you said right that you'd be laughed out of the room if you suggested that technology be used in a more meaningful way. Um, yeah, no, it's interesting. I can think of several instances um, where you know I caught flack for for, for something, and um, the the same uh, the same thing. Kind of saved my ass every time, which is I had top level cover. Um, I don't think that you're going to need that in the same way in the future. I think because it was so early on, that was really important. Um, you know, with with uh, in the Bush administration, what was interesting is there's a lot of resistance. But Secretary Rice and President Bush um, were actually both pretty into this. Uh, they didn't spend a lot of time on it, but um, they were both really interested in it. And Secretary Rice was really interested in this notion of putting tools in the hands of of people in particular in places like Iran and not telling them how to use them, um, sort of assuming that they know, you know, better than anyone sort of what risks and so forth to take. Um, but the, the President Bush was really engaged in Colombia, um, especially towards the end with the hostage rescue and everything. And then these anti FARC protests were, were just, you know, fascinating because it was the largest protest against a terrorist organization in history. Um, and I remember conversations we had with President Uribe. Um, he made the argument that because the, the movement against the FARC was able to happen so fast and because you couldn't Google search any of the activists because they had no online record, um, it was like the only credible protest that you know, Colombia could ever see. And it, it, it was very simple and credible. Um, and uh, we also- Because the absence of results was, because uh, Google added credibility. They're not 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 about not about Google. It's, it's that if they if you could search their names online, you could see like you know 
who had sort of smeared them or who they took money from or what party they were affiliated. These people had no online identity yet because it was still this 2008. Um, and so there was, there was sort of no way to really critique them because you didn't know who they, they were. Um, and getting all these people into the streets so quickly um, uh, was something that a lot of the FARC rebels had heard about on the radio and they had thought they were on the winning side. And so you saw the largest number of demobilizations and desertions from the FARC in its 40 plus year history during those two weeks that followed. And that, and that gave the government of Colombia um, an opening that it hadn't had in a very long time to step up its, its military operations. And so President Bush was really, he, he was just really fascinated by, by some of these, these, these dynamics. Um, and then Secretary Clinton championed this in, in, a, in, a, in a way that I, I really never imagined the Secretary of State would. Um, you know, agree with her or disagree with her, it's really interesting. Um, that she chose to take on issues of internet freedom as a major foreign policy part. I really did not, I thought we would have another 10 years before before that happened. Um, and, uh, and and so I think it's, it's as an issue, it's, it's, it's here to stay. And, and you know, the, the, you know, a lot of these things, whether it's the Arab Spring or Wishing Weeks or you know, the good and the bad stuff, it just happened all faster than we, I think any of us anticipated. And, and, and as I said at the beginning, I, I believe that, you know, the intersection of technology and geopolitics will have a profound impact. It's sort of like a lobbyist for these issues. It's an organic lobbyist for these issues um, in that it either, what happens either scares people in government or it makes people in government really excited. To, to what extent it do you think it introduces challenges for leadership though, right? Like radical trans, but we're center for public leadership. I mean, I think radical transparency has consequences for leadership. Uh, it's not just radical. Transparency. And if you look at the in the context of the Arab Spring, I think that the acceleration of movement making and this notion of a staff leader, um, you know, lends itself towards creating very fast public figures that can rise very quickly. But I think, you know, in some respects, it can retard leadership development. So if you look at the Mandelas and the De Gaulle's, um, you know, of, of, of the world, the Lequelesses of the world, it's harder to imagine them emerging in this internet era. And so, um, you know, it. In part, it's because the leaders that I just mentioned, I mean, we're talking decades of trial and error and imprisonment and you know, you know, maturing and training and you know, experience. And so you know, I don't want to be doomsday about this. I think what it means is that these revolutions, you know, yes, they'll, they'll, they'll be easier to start, they'll happen faster, but they're going to be harder to finish and they're going to take much longer than anybody thinks. And so what I think is going to happen in the Arab Spring is I think you know, uh, you're going to have a period where you know, it's very obvious that these sort of new leaders can't, you know, there, there's not really any new leaders that can run for president, win, and deliver in ways that are sort of that radically different from the previous regime. And so what you're going to get is a period where you have these sort of coalitions that include, you know, the good, the bad, and the ugly, and they'll rule for a while more as sort of autocratic coalitions. Um, and then 10 years from now, you know, what, you know, what will happen is people will literally go back through the tapes. Or over the next 10 years, people will literally go back through the tapes and look at some of the people with the most promise from the revolution who had phenomenal tactics and potential but didn't necessarily have the training and they'll literally backfill their leadership skills and so i think all these sort of quote internet activists that emerged in the arab spring um i think they're you know the ones that are successful are the ones that are going to make an exit for a little bit um you know sort of develop the more traditional training and come back into the fold in about 10 years so like, when you look at this room right uh of students they're gonna many of them are graduating in a month and they're going to go off to a wide range of journalism, government, NGO, local police departments, like a, just an international development, gigantic range. And what? And, and they're going to have to be leaders in in, in, in in their work. You know, how? What, what kinds of things do you think are important for them to think about or consider in terms of the role technology might play uh, in in their work and in their ability to be a, a good leader? I think in this day and age, nobody possesses all of the right skill sets um, in uh, th th themselves, and so I think that the successful leader today um, knows how to basically you know, build hybrid relationships. So <coughs> if you are an innovative person who wants to transform public health, you know, uh, and know a lot about public health, you know, find somebody who knows a lot about technology, maybe who's an engineer, understands mobile telephony, um, and you know, work with them and learn from each other. And so I think that. You know, the most successful leaders of the future will basically, you know, you know sort of develop these sort of pairings or, 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 you know, coalitions of people that have different skill sets, and then they'll all sort of emerge better off after the fact, having learned different skill sets from, from, from each other. Actually, building on that, isn't it possible that since the internet's a different structure, that the new structure of leadership is more like what you just talked about, 
and that leadership will be very distributed. And it'll be distributed based on who the point person needs to be to get something moving forward. Yeah, I mean, you, you can make an argument that leadership in the future will be, you know, be more about building connections than, than, than uh, you know, driving something forward yourself and you're sort of more of a, a, a uh, behind the scenes. You can, you can make the argument that a future leader is more of a behind the scenes person who can put different, you know, people together as, as, as necessary. And are you working on that? No, but I, I should. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it's a good idea. <laughs> So, Diane. <laughs> so kind of related to what you're saying about leadership and building skill sets, I'm um, I was a little surprised to hear that you would say like you don't see this notion, you know, these bound kind of state entities going away anytime soon. But you know, as people who are clearly learning to use technology that is slowly chipping away at a lot of like institutional um, processes, how do you think we're supposed to like as young people who are going to go into a wide variety of fields, like interact with institutions, whether we should continue aligning ourselves with them, or like how are we supposed to like kind of bridge this difference or understand like what's going on here in terms of? Like, no, it's a, it's a good question. Question. So states, I, I said states are here to stay. It doesn't mean I don't think they're going to be transformed, okay. um, especially institutions. I mean, institutions are going to are going to are going to uh, go through a massive transformation. I think you know. Uh, all of us in this room, you know, if we want to, can, can, can be part of that, right? You know, what is a, one of the sort of questions that I asked earlier today, I said, you know, imagine what a, you know, a future finance ministry looks like that's totally accountable and transparent. Imagine what a future ministry of interior looks like. I mean, you, you can actually, you know, begin to imagine what institutional reform looks like in a technological era. Now, there's also certain public goods, though, that, that, that only states will provide, right? Especially around certain aspects of, of security, but there are certain public goods that, you know, citizens, you know, with creative ideas and innovative ideas, you know, may have a potential to, to actually play an even more robust role. And so institutions will change. I'm just saying that, that you know, the world, you know, you know the, the sort of the dominance that states have in international, the Westphalian system is not going away, is basically my point. Um, so I, I really like what you're saying about, about the wide variety of fields. And I'm just, um, I've been seeing a lot of this type of activity that you've described popping up a little bit of everywhere. I mean, it sort of happens a lot around Boston, the whole MIT community, and that, that sort of culture. Um, but what I've seen a lot is, is engineers and software uh, designers and just you know, actual like, artists getting together to build really, really big projects that are at a fraction of the cost that it would take a government or a large company to do because they're doing it for fun. And they oftentimes educate each other. Um, what I would like to see is that kind of attitude being merged with, with global problems. Because I think that, that you're talking about the way that you work, and I think that if, if you could replicate the business model you're talking about, and I'm also working in, in a lot of places like the third world or you know, places like Iran, that we were talking about, you could have that same kind of political um, awareness and networking going on within a kind of endemic supply chain structure that could actually lead to manufacturing. And I was wondering if you had thought of that or really looked at sort of the more hardware end of things in the age of the 3D printer where you can not only transmit software but also hardware. I agree with everything you said. <laughs> <laughs> I, mean, I don't know that there's much to, to say beyond that. I mean, it, yes. Um, you know, one sort of interesting question to ask. I mean, how many people in this room by show of hands are engineers or have an engineering background? Um, um, how many of you who are not engineers by show of hands have uh, sort of engaged with engineers in a non-social way <laughs> not at a bar um, and I think so I, you represent a I actually think a minority I think this is there's um, that cross-disciplinary collaboration needs to needs to take place much more than it does today um, you know and I think a terrifyingly small number in this yeah. room and this is probably the largest subset of people in that category at this university would be my, would be my guess um, the, uh, the way that, uh, I mean, I think it's an easier sell for, for you all, I think it's a harder sell for people in the engineering school. Uh, and uh, um, if, 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 I, if I remember my college days, my, my computer science friends were up all night coding all the time. Um, and it was very, you know, but I think that, you know, there's a very, very sort of exciting moment for collaboration across the humanities and, and computer science and electrical engineering. My question is kind of related to Diane's in that um, there's a number of people, like we have a Tech for Change here at the Kennedy School, we're really excited about using technology for social good. Um, kind of the traditional route of Kennedy School graduates is to go through government and try and work there. But there's a lot of trepidation, especially for people like me who come from the private sector, 
about the constraints of working through the government. So I was wondering if you, kind of what constraints you experienced and if you would recommend going there as a, as a route for doing that. So it's funny, I, I get, I'm really defensive of, of public service. I, I, it gets a really bad rap. I had a really good experience in government. I, my four years in the policy planning staff, I did not find bureaucratic at all. I found there was a lot of space to do creative things. And you, know, you can say I had the right mentors or I was in the right space, and there's probably some truth to that. Um, but I also think, you know, any job is what you make of it, and I know that's something we all hear a lot, but you know, you can choose to have yourself put in a bureaucratic box, or you can choose to break a little China. Um, I opt for breaking a little China. Um, I, I do believe when you're thinking about your next job, and, and I, I've only recently come to appreciate this, which is you pick your next job. The, I, the formula that I use is pick your next job by who your boss is, and then assume the next job you want doesn't exist, and then go to your new boss and ask them to create it. Um, I, I think that's a good model, actually. And, and you know, you know, I, I sort of look back at my time on policy planning, and the portfolio that I did in policy planning didn't exist. Um, so create it, right? So, so every company, every government arm, every NGO, every organization, any of you work for, there's going to be a gap. Um, if there's a gap, that's typically a problem that the entity that you're working for acknowledges. And you know, as long as you find it interesting and you're passionate about it, go, go, go fill it and go build your role around what that gap is. Um, the nice part about doing that, by the way, is you don't step on anybody's toes. Um, and so you, there's not as much sort of you know, competition. And so at least until people notice, you have a little bit of leeway um, to, to, to you know, try to get a few things off the ground. Um, you touched briefly on other companies. Are there any other companies that are doing anything even remotely similar to what you're up to? Um, I don't know. Um, and I think it would be unfair for me to say no, um, because I haven't really looked into it. Uh, you know, because Google Ideas is so young, my, my focus right now is building it out, um, you know, getting some more proofs of concept off the ground, you know, making sure that, that uh, you know, we're constantly iterating on the model. Um, you know, I, I think there will be a time to sort of explore this more, but I think the best thing that we can do right now is uh, make this successful by example. Um, and one way to sort of know if other companies are doing this or thinking about this is if they start you know, approaching us, um, or if we start bumping into them uh, on things, which I think would be a, a good thing. Um, it's, it started to happen, actually, um, around some of the issues we're working on. Um, and uh, uh, I think there, there's, there's been a lot of conversations, just sort of in, in, informally, because it's a small industry. Um, and uh, so I think we're, we're already off to a good start on that. As you're growing and formalizing Google Ideas, I'm wondering if you know what you don't know. Probably what, not. What um, <laughs> I, 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 I could tell you I, I could tell you all the things that I don't know, but yeah, there's probably a bunch of things I, I don't know as well. Um, the, uh, yeah, I don't have a great. It's a good question, but, but I don't have a good answer. Really growing um, formalizing. Yeah, I don't. I don't know. Um, you know, it's every six months. Um, it just feels so different. I'm going to go into that iteration a couple of times, but it, it, it's uh, so it's more like every every three months. But it um, the sort of atmosphere around Google Ideas just constantly changes, and that's kind of it. Certainly keeps you on your toes. Um, but I, I I don't know. I don't have. A, it, it's a very good question. I don't have a good answer. Sorry. Okay, last question. Just just uh, <clears throat> not so much a question. It's just to to add to what you just said. There are. I was thinking about this while you were talking. There are quite a few other companies, large established companies, who aren't anywhere near as casual, I don't mean that in a negative sense, as Google, uh, but are doing, in a sense, trying to do the same thing, usually under the foundation, some sort of foundation. So, for example, um, Procter & Gamble has been extraordinarily effective in working all over the world. Now, their business rationale is for selling stuff all over the world, like diapers. Okay, whatever. But they have a separate, some of that's coming directly out of budgets in the business. Uh, and it's very loose. I and mean, there are wonderful things going on that they're working with other people. IBM, same thing. SC Johnson and Company. There are a lot of companies that are very, very good at this. They don't make big speeches about it. But in a way, you're maybe holding down one end of a spectrum of ways of addressing these things. But it'd be very interesting to connect some of that up because mostly they're under the radar some ways, even more than you are. <laughs> but we do work with, I mean, everything that I do at Google Ideas, everything we do, we work with other private companies, we work with NGOs, we work with academics, if appropriate, we work with governments. And so 
um, if any project that we're working on has some other company involved in it. It's maybe not, it's not always the sort of big name companies often, we work actually a lot with small startups. Um, and what we find is they're, they're enthusiastic about working with Google and they care a lot about the, the, the issues. And so um, there's plenty of that collaboration, uh, plenty of that collaboration going on. Thank you, Jared.